Father in heaven, once again, we invite you to not just fill this place, but to fill our hearts, fill our minds with the truths of your word, and draw us closer and closer to the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. For I pray it in his name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I want you to picture this in your mind, this scene. I want you to imagine that in the distance there's some thunder rolling in the heavens. That thunder is punctuated with the rhythmic chanting of the priests as they slowly make their way up a long incline to the Temple Mount. And as the priests take their positions around the altar, there's a few men that come up behind them. And with them is a young, very beautiful woman with her hands tied behind her back. Her eyes are glistening with tears. Her face shows fear, but she does not resist. And so they bring her to where the priests stand. They lay her on the altar. And as the priests began to make their incantations, offering prayers to their gods, asking for a good harvest that fall, asking for victory over their enemies, asking that their gods, please, please don't be angry with us anymore. Please accept this sacrifice as an appeasement for our sins. And when the prayer is over and the chants are done, the head priest lifts the dagger into the air and brings it down with deadly force. And the young lady's life is taken. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. And yet we have the evidence of it. Cultures, societies around the world that have felt the necessity to sacrifice. And in this case, to sacrifice even a human being. It's a terrible story, but it's, it's true. There's a, there's a need in the heart of human beings. Think about it. There's a need to offer worship and to offer sacrifice to God. This morning, I want us to look for a few minutes at the Bible record of offerings, of sacrifice. And there we find the record is very clear that in the nation of Israel, God's people, when they were wandering there in the wilderness, they were called upon to offer sacrifice as a part of their religious observance. And so we're going to look at a sacrifice tonight, the sacrifice of all in the form of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, a sacrifice that he willingly gave for each of us. Because all of us, the Bible says, have sinned and what? Come short of the glory of God. We are destined for death. Destined to be sacrificed ourselves. No chance for eternal life. But God says, I've got another plan. I've got something that I want to tell you about. I've got some good news that there will be a sacrifice made available and there will be one who will give his life in order to save your lives and that is the son of God himself and what we're going to find out today is that he came not only did he come as the Bible said he would as the prophecy said he would but he came right on time right on schedule in fact to the very day and even the very hour of when he was prophesied to come. It's an absolutely amazing discovery. Sacrifice for sin. Sacrificing innocent lambs. Why in the world did God ask his people to sacrifice animals? Now remember, he never asked, ever asked for them to sacrifice any human beings. That was something that the pagan nations around would do but not God's people, not under his direction. We're going to look at this for a few minutes tonight. You can see there on the screen 
that uh, the people of Israel were there in the wilderness. God asked them to set up a tabernacle. Remember that? He said, set up a tabernacle that I may come and be with you. Come and worship me as you come to this tabernacle. And so this was a building. It was a small portable building that they could set up and take down, move from place to place as they traveled through the wilderness. And they did this for 40 years in the desert. Now, the interesting thing is that at the very center of this tabernacle service was animal sacrifice. And you could bring uh, a bird if you were poor. You could, uh, most of the people brought lambs, but you could bring a goat. There were, there were oxen that were uh, also sacrificed and other clean animals brought to the Lord, brought for sacrifice there in the Old Testament. Now, I, I can't imagine how many animals uh, had to give their life over the course of that period of time in order for the people to receive the forgiveness of their sins when they brought their animal. Hundreds, some thousands of them, I'm sure, maybe millions of them uh, were sacrificed as God had called them to do uh, there in the tabernacle. And the question is, well, why in the world did God ask them to do this? Why would he uh, command them to do this uh, in order for them to receive their forgiveness of sin? Well, first of all, I believe that God wanted his people, he wanted the Israelites to remember and to understand that the wages of sin is what? Death. Now, if you're taking notes, let me give you a text here, and uh, you'll be glad to know it's no extra charge today. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says that. The wages of sin is death. When we rebel against God, when we, we turn our back against him, we forfeit our right to life. And Adam and Eve, when they took of the fruit, God says, in the day that you take it, you will what? You will surely die. Now, did they die instantly that day when they took the fruit? No, they didn't drop dead after they took a bite of that fruit. But did they begin to die? Yes, they did. They were separated from God. Remember, he, he, he took them out. They had to go out of the garden. And from then on, uh, their life was countdown to their death. So the wages of sin is death. Now it's interesting that every time that an Israelite would sin, what did they have to do? They had to bring a sacrifice. They had to bring an animal to the tabernacle, confess their sin, and it's interesting, again, if you're taking notes, let me give you a text here. It's Leviticus chapter 1. If you want to read about this, uh, it's, uh, it's fascinating to read how this happened. They were to bring an animal without blemish. The animal without blemish represented whom? Jesus Christ, the pure, the, the spotless Lamb of God. An animal without blemish. And the Bible says in Leviticus 1, they were to offer this animal, it says, and I'm quoting now, of their own free will. So this was nothing to be forced. This was nothing that God said they, they had to do. They, they, he wanted them to do it because they understood this plan of salvation and they did it of their own free will. They brought the animal to the, the gate of the tabernacle, to the door of the tabernacle. Then the sinner would put his hand on the head of that animal. And the Bible says that that animal then would be accepted on behalf of that man to make atonement for their sin. So in a symbolic way, the sin of the person was transferred to the head of that lamb, of the animal, and then the priest took a knife and slit the throat of that animal. Is that right? No. I'm glad there are some good Bible students here. That's not what happened next. What happened next? The sinner himself took a knife. The sinner himself slit the throat of that innocent animal and watched it die there in front of him. And then the priest took the blood and sprinkled it around the altar. And so this was an object lesson that was to be burned deeply into their mind. The wages of sin is what? Death. Death can never be taken lightly. Sin can never be taken lightly because of what it causes. It causes death. Now there's another reason that God asked them to do this. He wanted them to know that in order to receive forgiveness for their sin, 
there had to be a substitute. And that little lamb, that innocent little without a blemish lamb that was brought was a representation of him and that lamb represented a substitute. God never wanted them to forget that. And, uh, and this kind of reminds us of John the Baptist. You remember John the Baptist? He was crying out in the wilderness there by the River Jordan. And uh, it must have been a tough life for this guy. He, uh, he was out there, but he loved God, and he was there to give a message, and he did it with all of his heart, preparing the way for the first coming of Jesus Christ. Serving God and baptizing people as they came to repentance there in the Jordan River. And one day as he's preaching away, who does he see coming in the distance? None other than Jesus Christ himself, that's right. And he knew and he recognized Jesus and he saw him as the Son of God, as a fulfillment of the messianic prophecies that we're going to look at tonight. The next day, the Bible says, John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Behold... The Lamb of God who does what? Takes away the sin of the world. Jesus calls him the Lamb of God. It's not by accident. That was the most common sacrificial animal that they brought when they, when they brought their uh, sacrifices to the temple. And of course he was referring to Jesus as the Lamb, as the, the sacrificial Lamb of God. Uh, Revelation talks about uh, the Lamb as well. Revelation 13, verse 8. And uh, there you see it there. The Lamb that was slain from when? From the foundation of the world. Well, what in the world does that mean? From the foundation of the world. It just means that in God's plan, in God's love for His human family, that He knew what was going to happen before it happened. What do you say? He was prepared for it. It didn't take Him by surprise when Adam and Eve fell. And when the world took off on its own direction, God knew that that was going to happen. He knew that there would be a fall. He knew about sin, and he was ready for it. He planned a way of escape. And it was all part of the eternal plan of salvation. He knew that his son would come and die in order to save us from eternal death. Praise the Lord for that kind of love. Now, in society today, uh, you know, we, uh, we're able to purchase insurance in case there's some kind of a catastrophe in the future, right? If uh, you think that there might be a, a fire, uh, if you, uh, and we had a lot of fires this summer all around us, uh, you can buy fire insurance. If uh, you want to, you can be protected from, uh, from floods. Uh, you can buy, insurance companies will sell you these policies that uh, will, uh, will give you money in case your home gets destroyed, you can rebuild. Uh, but I want you to know there are uh, some places where you, if you decide to live there where you cannot buy insurance. You know what I'm talking about? You live in a floodplain. Um, or if you live in a real uh, place where there's a lot of earthquakes, uh, it's very difficult or, or almost impossible to buy insurance because they expect that there's going to be a flood. There's going to be an earthquake, and so it's ridiculous to sell you a policy because they would go broke, right? They sold policies to everybody that was in all of these really dangerous places, so there's some places they won't, they won't take a chance. But here's the good news. In our case, here in this world, on this planet in rebellion, God knew that we were going to make a mess out of things, didn't He? He knew we were going to wreak havoc here on this place that he had made for us, this perfect world. He knew beforehand that our house was going to go up in smoke. He knew it was coming. He knew there would be sin. He knew there would be death. He knew there would be destruction. And yet, he insured us anyway. What do you say? He still gave insurance. And that insurance policy is found in the person, in the Lamb of God himself. The Bible tells us that this plan was in, in existence before the world was made. Each of us have been covered by the blood of the Lamb. So regardless of who you are this morning, regardless of what you've done, regardless of how far you may have strayed away from the Father's love and from the Father's house, today is an invitation to come back and to follow the Lamb. He's paid the penalty. No matter what it is you've done, 
And he calls for us today to come and follow him again. Do you feel guilty for your past sins? Do you go around wondering if you've really been forgiven? Do you carry guilt for what you may have done or may not have done in the past? If that's the case, maybe you're thinking, whoa, I'm not ready for the judgment. I'm not ready to stand before God. There's no way I can make it. And so you're going from day to day in fear. You're living in fear. And I'm here to tell you that perfect love, and that's the love of the Lamb of God, perfect love casts out what? Casts out fear. There's no need for us to be afraid, no matter what our past may look like. And Jesus Christ, who's paid the penalty, says now, come. My arms are open, the invitation is sure, and you can have a future that has hope in it because of me, because what I have done for you. The assurance is there. I read a story of a little boy that came home from school every day, and the problem with this little fellow was that he would always get distracted on the way home. He would always find some friends to play with or uh, get involved in his own uh, games, and he would always come home late, and his parents warned him repeatedly that if you keep coming home, there's going to be consequences. Well, finally, they got so fed up, they said, if you come home late again, instead of having a nice dinner like we usually have when you come home, uh, you're, you're going to have a piece of bread and a glass of water. That's going to be your supper. That's it. Well, maybe he didn't believe them, whatever, but he was late again. So he gets home, and what does he see in front of him? Just what they said. Their plates are all piled high with good food, nice hot food. And his little plate there, all he had was an old piece of bread and a glass of water. And he stared down at that, and it finally dawned on him that his parents were serious about what they had said. And the poor little guy, hungry as he was, he, he just started to cry. Little, little fellow, tears coming down his cheeks. And just as he was reaching for that little piece of bread, his father reached over, took the plate with the bread on it, took it in front and put it in front of himself, in place gave his son a plate full of food for him to eat. The penalty had to be paid, didn't it? But in this case, it was paid by a loving father. I'm thankful we have a father like that, aren't you? For he, that is God, I love this promise, First, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he, God the Father, made him, who's the him? Jesus Christ, who knew no sin to be what? Sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You talk about a transaction. You talk about an amazing, the most amazing transaction in the history of the world. It's Jesus, the spotless, sinless Son of God, becoming sin, taking the sin and the guilt of you and me, of everyone in this room, of the whole world on Him, and exchanging that for His righteousness, for His perfect obedience. And that sacrifice is what gives us hope this morning. And that sacrifice is available to every single one of us that's in this room. Everyone who may be listening or, or watching this program. Did you realize that these programs that we've been having, including Sabbath morning, I believe are on the YouTube? I believe they are. It's exciting to know that the message, God's message, is going out over the airways. What do you say? And so through him, we have the hope of eternal life. It's available to us. No matter the past, he says, we can start fresh. We can start new right now. Now, I want to share something very exciting with you that helps to affirm our faith. It's the reason that we can be so certain about what we are talking about today. And it's a prophecy that is given in the Old Testament that uh, shows us uh, that our belief and our faith in Jesus is based on reality and on fact. Now, I said to 
uh, our class this morning, a few minutes earlier, that I'm very thankful that we have the whole Bible and that we have the Old Testament and the New Testament together. Aren't you glad for that? Because the new is in the old contained, the old is in the new explained. We have a fuller explanation of the old in the new, but the new is in the old, and we're going to see that more tonight. But here in this prophecy, 500 years before it happened, we have these words that come to us and tell us exactly when this Lamb of God would come. Now, remember uh, just how accurate this is, and we'll see this in just a second. It tells us the exact um, time, almost to the hour, of when the lamb would be slain. We go back now to the prophecy, and this is found in the book of Daniel, and I want you to uh, follow along with me. Now, when you leave today, I uh, just want to remind you, don't leave before you get a copy of the material. Some of the material we're talking about here will be with, uh, in a printed form for you to take with you, so uh, you be sure and get that on the way out. So Daniel, the prophet Daniel is is praying one day, and he's praying over the city of Jerusalem and over his people. He's very worried about what's going to happen to them because of a prophecy that had been given to him earlier. Now, I have to, I have to stop for just a minute, and I want you to, if you have your Bible, uh, I want you to notice something here in the book of Daniel uh, that has to do with, with this very passage and, and this prayer that he prayed. This is a prayer that Daniel prays for understanding of what God had showed him already previously. And he's praying, and uh, if you look at Daniel 9, and uh, we begin with verse 20. Uh, these, are, these are just three or four verses here that I just have to, uh, I have to share with you, and uh, you can add them to your notes. It says, now while I was speaking, this is Daniel talking, and he was and praying and confessing what? my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplication, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved, therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. Did you get a, a, a grasp of what we just read? Daniel is praying for an understanding of what God had said to him previously. And the Bible says that while he was praying this prayer, what happened? An angel of God, not just any angel, the angel Gabriel was sent on the command of God to, to fly from heaven. Now, I don't know how many billions of miles heaven is where God's throne is. You know, the Bible talks about the third heaven. And so I don't know how many... I don't know how many light years that is away from us. All I know that is if Daniel is praying this prayer, which was rather short, by the time he ended the prayer, where was Gabriel? Not by the throne of God, but where? Standing beside Daniel. The Bible says that the angels are ministering spirits sent from God. And look what God did for Daniel in response to his prayer. It's absolutely amazing. Now, does prayer work? <laughs> prayer works. I don't know what angel God sent in, in response to Bob's prayer and Tim's prayer on behalf of Ivy. I don't know if it was Gabriel or not, but I believe an angel was there. I believe maybe many angels were there. It's just a great and a very humbling thought to realize that the creator of heaven and earth, our God, knows us, cares about us, responds to our prayers in such a way as this. 
So the, prayer, the, the answer to Daniel's prayer comes. He's, he, Daniel says, I am confused. He says, I'm afraid of what's going to happen. Um, our, our city has been taken. Our country has been taken by the Babylonians. And he's praying and he, he's trying to figure out what's going to happen and uh, what's, gonna, what, what's in the future. And here is what uh, the angel says. Seventy weeks are determined for you, for your people, and for your holy city. Uh, the word determined, it has to do with you. It has to do with your people, with your city. <clears throat> Seventy weeks were going to happen. 70, something significant is going to happen in this period of time, and it's specifically having to do with you and with your people. All right? Now, if you think about 70 weeks and you multiply it out, 70 weeks are about 16 months, but in the Bible, and especially when we're talking about prophetic time, uh, the Bible uh, tells us that a day is for a year. A day represents a year, symbolic for a year. In Numbers 14, it says that, each day for a year. Also in Ezekiel 4, verse 6, I have laid on you each day for a year. So that's a principle, a scriptural principle in helping us to understand prophecy. So we need to find out when the starting point is of this prophecy and then we can figure out what it really means and where it goes. Know therefore, so here, here's the explanation, here's what the angel is telling him. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until whom? Until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So how many weeks is that? 69, that's right. So get a, get a picture now. Jerusalem, the, the city that Daniel and his friends had been taken from was in ruins, destroyed by the Babylonians. The Medo-Persians were, were soon to come. And, uh, the, and the Bible says, and the prophecy said, that you're going to be allowed, something's going to happen positive. The, uh, the, the people will be allowed to go back. They'll be allowed to rebuild the city and rebuild the temple. And so that was some good news. To restore and rebuild Jerusalem, he says, that will be at the time, the beginning of the prophecy will be at that point, and then unto Messiah the Prince would be 69 weeks. And 69 weeks times seven days a week equals what? 483 days but since we're in prophetic time, we're talking about 483 years. That's right. And uh, so this might help a little. I think this is on your handout that you'll get as you leave here uh, in just a few minutes. So the starting point of this 70-week prophecy that has to do with, with Daniel, with his people, starts in the year 457 B.C. Now, this is a solid date in history. You can go and look it up. There were actually, there, were more than, there was more than one decree that was given, but this is the third decree and the final decree and the most expansive decree, in other words, uh, the best decree for uh, God's people because they were allowed to rebuild the temple, they were allowed to reestablish their worship and uh, establish their own court system as well. So this was the most significant uh, of, the, of all of the decrees and it came in 457 B.C., so it says, these 69 weeks of the 70 come before Messiah. The Messiah Prince comes at the end of that time, at the, at that last, uh, during that last week. So we'll see that in a minute. Now, who is Messiah the Prince? Any question about that? I don't think so. Messiah, this is interesting. You may want to jot a note or two down. The word Messiah itself means anointed one, the anointed one. Now, who was the anointed one? There he is, none other than Jesus Christ himself. And when was he anointed? Well, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Now, it's interesting how the Bible identifies the exact year that this happens. And this is not an accident because God and his wisdom knew that someday the people here in Lacey were going to be looking at this and thinking, now, how can I really figure this out? And so there's so many concrete events and he ties it down to the very year of this king and of Pilate and he says if you really want to know you can find out check history isn't that good isn't that great how he how he did this in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea when all of the people were baptized it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized 
and while he prayed, the heaven was opened, the Bible goes on, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a what? Like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. So do you, you get a picture of what's happening here? This is, this is just a, a, an incredible scene. Jesus comes up out of the water. He's about 30 years old. At his baptism, the Bible says, the voice of his heavenly Father says, this is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit is there as well in the form of a dove. So we have all the members of the Trinity all there together at one time in one place. Jesus baptized, Holy Spirit descends, and the Father anoints him for his work, for his public ministry. This was when Jesus started his ministry. And you say to yourself, well, why in the world? And I thought about this, I thought about this in the past. Why did Jesus wait until he was 30 years old? That's pretty old to start a ministry, right? So he was at home working in the carpenter shop until he was 30 years old. Sometimes we think, you know, if, if, if guys are still at home at 30 years old, what do we think? You know, come on, what's going on with that? You know, come on, get out there, get a life, you know, get a, get a real job. Don't be hanging around the house, you know. Jesus was hanging around the house, but he was hanging around the house for a reason. It wasn't because he was afraid of starting his earthly ministry. What was the reason that he didn't start his earthly ministry until he was 30? Why? Because the time wasn't right yet. That's right. Because the prophecy, in order for it to be fulfilled exactly as the, as the prophet said it would, it had to happen this way in this year, and Jesus had to be the age he was at this year. Unbelievable. Now remember, this was all written 500 years or more before his birth. Unto Messiah the Prince. And that was going to be in A.D. 27, just as the Bible predicted it would be. What, a, what an awesome prophecy. I'll tell you, the Bible is just no ordinary book. What do you say? No ordinary book. It helps us to know there is a God. There is a God who's in control. There's a God who knows what's happening and knows what's coming. And he's, and he's let us in on it. That's, that's the good news. All right, so, so far, we're, uh, we're looking here at a time, at a, at a prophecy that has covered 483 years. It begins, it, it brings us to the beginning of Christ's ministry. And then it says that after the 69th week, after that 483 years, Messiah would be what? Cut off, but not for himself. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's pretty clear that after this time, after this uh, final year of the 483 years, that the Messiah would, would be killed, but he wouldn't be killed, you know, just as a regular execution. He would be sacrificed, not for himself, but for you and for me. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, that while we were still sinners, what? Christ died for us. Now the prophecy tells us even more. Remember, we covered 69 of the 70 weeks, right? Right? So there's still one more week to go. Now I want you to notice this very carefully. This is important. Because there are some very well-meaning Christians, many of them, that somehow have taken this 70th week in this prophecy. And what have they done to it? They have pushed it. They've, they've, they've separated it from these 70 weeks and this, six, and this 70th week, they have pushed it way down into the future at some point, and we don't really know when that is, but it's not connected anymore with this prophecy. And I'm saying, unless this 70th week is connected to this prophecy, the whole prophecy loses its meaning. 
And when you have a prophecy of time like this, you can't just willy-nilly take a piece of it and move it down someplace in the future or in some future time and, and, and be correct in your interpretation of the prophecy. It doesn't work that way. A time prophecy has to stay together. So when you're talking with others or when you're reading other material and, you're, and you hear about the, the 70th week, that's what it's talking about. But I'm, I want you to go back now. You'll know where it's coming from and you'll know the real meaning of what, it, what it's trying to say. So this 70th week, we have to understand what's happening in that 70th week because that's part of this 70-week prophecy. All right? Now here's what's going to happen. It says in Daniel 9, 27, Then he, that is Messiah, the prince, will confirm a covenant with many for one week. There's that week. But in the middle of the week, he shall what? Bring an end to sacrifice and offerings. What in the world is it talking about? It's saying in the middle of that week, three and a half years into that final week, and that week is seven years, right? Seven days. We're talking about it, though, in terms of prophetic time, so it's seven years. In the middle of that seven-year period of time, so three and a half years after A.D. 27, Jesus, the Messiah, it says, would give himself and bring an end to sacrifice. Well, I'm here to tell you, he came and he did that right on time. And you know, the Passover celebration was right. This was right in the middle of Passover. It was on a Friday. It was in the spring of A.D. 31. And the Bible says, and Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 5, Christ, our what? Our Passover was sacrificed for us. Christ, our what? Our Passover. So here, he's the fulfillment of those Old Testament feasts, those Old Testament festivals. He is the Passover, the true Passover, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And on the cross, he shed his blood. And the fulfillment of this prophecy came in Jesus Christ, the one who was cut off, but not for himself. And those sacrifices that have been coming all of those years up to that point, they cease to have any meaning anymore after this sacrifice because Jesus was the fulfillment of those shadows from the past, from the Old Testament. That sacrificial system now found its fulfillment in the real Lamb of God. There was a husband who went off to sea and he was gone for a very, very long time Every day he was gone, his wife would take out his picture and look at his picture and remember him and then put the picture back in the drawer. Well, <clears throat> the years passed by. He was gone for much longer than he had intended. So every day she would take the picture out. Every day she would be reminded of him as she looked at that picture. And then one day he came home. And from then on, he said, I'm retired now. I'm not going away anymore. I'm going to be with you. The rest of our lives we're going to spend together. How often do you think that she took the picture out of the drawer after she had him back? She didn't need the picture anymore, right? She had her husband with her. And they were going to be together for all their future. And so it was that in this sense, Jesus came he was the fulfillment. They had the shadow. They had the picture. Every day when they brought the animals, the sacrifices, they had that picture. But when the reality came, the picture wasn't necessary anymore. The shadow was no longer necessary. And when the Bible talks about that there was a law nailed to the cross, it's the ceremonial law. It's this law that had to do with sacrifices. No longer needed. Because the real thing had come. And we see that illustrated there in the scriptures. You can read about it. Because it says there, as that priest was about to offer that sacrifice on the Passover, what happened to the temple? What happened to the veil? It was torn in half. The Bible says it was torn from the top to the bottom. Unbelievable. You can read it there in Mark 15. The veil torn in two from top to bottom. <clears throat> and that was the center of the sacrificial system. That's what God said was what the people had to do, but it was no longer needed and no longer required. And even though they kept on sacrificing for a while, it didn't mean anything anymore because the true Messiah, the true Lamb of God, had come. 
halfway through, just as the prophecy said, three and a half years, sacrifice was made. Then at the end of the, three, the next uh, three and a half years, which would be the end of the 70th year, right, came in 34 A.D., three and a half years after the death of Jesus, and that is when the gospel message began to go to the Gentiles. Remember the, remember the prophecy said, the 70 years is determined, is, is, has to do with your people, right? Has to do with the Jewish nation. And after that time, God said, okay, as a Jewish nation, you have rejected the Son of God. And now, the message that I wanted to share through them will have to be taken and given to others who will take that message now because you have refused it. And so exactly, that is exactly what happened. And uh, in A.D. 34, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see it there, Stephen became the first martyr of the Christian church. Remember him? He was stoned to death because of his testimony, because of his belief in Jesus. And they killed him. But that was the beginning then of the gospel message being taken to the Gentiles. I'm, I'm very thankful that, uh, that that happened because I'm a Gentile. We're all Gentiles, right? At least most of us probably are. And then Acts chapter, four, or chapter 8, verse 4 says, Therefore those who were scattered, and there was a great persecution that came, they went everywhere preaching the word. An absolute amazing Bible prophecy. 500 years before it happened, and it happened just as the prophet said that it would. Do you see why that 70th week is so important to the whole picture? If you take that 70th week and what Messiah did in that week and you push it away, then the whole prophecy kind of falls apart. It doesn't have any meaning. That 70th week is the focal point of the whole prophecy. And the center of that prophecy is Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, those who push that way down to the end it's been somehow turned upside down because the center of the prophecy in that theory at the end of time instead of Jesus being the center who's the center it's the Antichrist it's the Antichrist so you can see how dangerous it is to uh, manipulate or to mess with a prophecy especially a time prophecy like this do you love Jesus this morning he was crucified in the midst of that week. The gospel was given then to the whole world, the Gentile world. And you and I have the benefit of being able to accept the perfect robe of Christ's righteousness. The perfect obedience that he had, he gives to us. He covers us with that robe. And we are looked upon by the Father as though we had never sinned because He is looking at us through the robe, the righteousness of His Son. Amen. What an amazing, amazing grace. And we don't have to bring an animal. We don't have to sacrifice it out here in front of the door. And, and I don't have to come out and sprinkle blood, you know, around the pulpit. And I'm glad for that, aren't you? The sacrifice has been made once and for all in Jesus Christ. And what we need to do is, is come and say yes to the sacrifice that he has made for us as our substitute. What a Savior. And I want you to, to think of this personally. I, don't think about anybody else here today or, or anybody else that may not be here. Think about this for yourself. And I'm going to think about it for myself that he did this for me, right? He did this for me. What am I going to do with this amazing grace? I want to close by telling you a story of a little girl who was very sick. <clears throat> she was very sick. Doctors did all that they could for her. But it came down to where she needed a blood transfusion very badly. Now, her younger brother had had the same 
disease that she had, but he had recovered. He'd gotten better, and so his blood was stronger and had the antibodies needed to fight this disease. And the doctors decided that the only chance for the recovery of this little girl was if they were able to give a transfusion of her brother's blood to her, that she needed that right now. And if she didn't have it, it would, it would probably be too late for her. So the doctors and the parents sat down with the little fellow, and they told him that his sister was dying and that only he and, and his blood would be able to save his sister. The doctor very gently said to him, would you be willing to give your blood to your sister to marry? Little fellow hesitated for just a minute, kind of bit his lower lip and he began to, to tremble just a little bit, shake a little bit, and finally he said, okay, I'll do it for her. I'll do it for my sister. You bet I will. So they brought him into the hospital room. His sister was in the next bed, barely able to move. They laid him down. He was still shaking, obviously, afraid. The nurse put the, the needle into his arm. His blood began to flow into his sister's arm, into her veins. And then the little fellow, as he lay there pale, still looked very concerned. And the doctor came over to him and he said, well, it's all over now. You were great. Thank you for your willingness to give your blood to your sister. And the little fellow didn't seem very happy. The doctor said, well, what's, what's wrong? What's the matter? The little fellow looked up with all the innocence of a child and he said, Doc, when am I going to die? The doctor said, what? So when am I going to die? Oh, no. No, no, the doctor said, you misunderstood. You're not going to die. You gave your, your blood, but you still have lots of blood. You'll be fine. What a relief that must have been to the little fellow. But here's the point. When he was asked if he'd give his blood, what did he think? He thought he was going to die, and yet he was willing to do it anyway. And I'm here to tell you today, that we have an elder brother. His name is Jesus. And Jesus said, I'm willing to give my blood. I'm willing to sacrifice as a lamb for the salvation of my people as a sacrifice for sin.